Oh, it's good to be here. I was out here once before for a breakfast meeting when I first started at Lexington. Uh, I've been ducking now for over a year and a half. Uh, I came from Maryland, so I'm familiar with poultry. I grew up in Delaware. Uh, I always tell everyone my grandmother graduated from high school, Frank the Newton's mother. So uh, I come from chicken capital of the world. Uh, and uh, Terry asked us to talk about uh, poultry litter use, its economic use in grain production, and kind of building up to some of the stuff that uh, Jordan's going here with the uh, economics on poultry north. So I'm going to go through the basics, and then uh, Evan's going to take over with uh, some research that he's been doing and some other things. So I'll jump right into it. So the four R's and number two. Uh, <laughs> poultry north <nor> humor. <laughs> um, so the right rate, you know, the lower the rate, you might provide a higher nitrogen return and limit the phosphorus risk. So you'll find that I kind of dance back and forth between some of the environmental impacts, but also the production impacts of manage, management of poultry litter. Because everything we do in agriculture is a push pull. Every good thing to the bad thing, that's, that's just life. And so it's really a balancing act to say, well, we're going to manage this for the highest efficiency from a production standpoint and try to minimize some of the environmental impact. And we'll get into more of that, that, you know, I came from the Chesapeake Bay region and was, was glad to kind of get away from that for a while and move out here. And, and, and as Edwin likes to say, we don't want this to be the next Chesapeake. We don't want what we had there to come here as far as um, the norm management stuff. They're still fighting it there. I was on the phone with uh, uh, Friday. I was texting back and forth with a guy that works with Purdue Farms because they're fighting some legislation in, in Maryland still. So, But anyway, so the right rate. A lower rate can actually give you better production if, uh, in your crops for nitrogen management. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, I think I already killed the clicker. The clicker's dead, Gary. Oh. Uh, it's asking me questions about color scheme. Hang on. There we go. All right. Timing. Fall apply manure provides little nitrogen value. So that's the timing issue, the right time, the right place. Surface application has the potential to lose nutrients, but tillage has the potential to lose soil. So what I'm pointing out here is it's always a push-pull. There's benefits to surface application and no-till, and there's drawbacks to surface application and no-till. And source. Source, when we talk about the right rate of four hours for fertilizer, we talk about the source, the type of fertilizer, and we're talking about poultry litter. Uh, I get asked a lot of questions about additives to poultry litter, to take more advantage of your bucket out of nutrients. To date, there's no real science behind any of the additives to poultry litter as far as making a more effective nutrient source. So, you know, these things that we add to poultry that some people try to sell you some stuff to apply to the poultry litter, I don't necessarily think there's much benefit to it. So, talking about the nitrogen cycle. Manure nitrogen is all about understanding the nitrogen cycle. So, uh, this is where you kind of get into the heavy soil science. This is the nitrogen cycle. Your computer's giving me fits, Gary. Keeps asking if I want to change the color scheme. Yeah, keep the same. Yeah. Um, so, this is the nitrogen cycle. It's very complex, and I'm going to try and break it down and simplify it. It's got a lot of components, and a lot of these components are, are, are kind of managed by the soil mi microorganisms, which makes it even more complicated because then it's, it's really weather dependent. So to simplify it, I'm going to break it down into pieces. When you apply poultry litter, you're basically applying organic nitrogen, some ammonium, and a lot of urea. You're going to have to use your, <laughs> your thing. I'm going to break your screen is what's going to happen. So you've got urea, ammonium, and organic nitrogen when you apply poultry litter. Um, and the urea is just like urea fertilizer. In the presence of urease, which is everywhere, it's even in the litter already from wood chips, you're going to have that urea is going to go to ammonium, which the plants can take up. But, you know, some of the microorganisms can also take ammonium back to organic end. But generally, when you apply poultry litter, the movement is from urea to ammonium. Oh. I got it. There we go. Thanks. I told it not to show again. I'm taking that five times to learn anything. So, the problem with ammonium is if you're surface applying to no till, which a lot of us are, it becomes ammonia and volatilizes off. You can smell that. And that's always happening. So, you've got urea going to ammonium, going to ammonia, and it goes off as a gas into the atmosphere. So, you're losing nitrogen that way when you surface apply poultry litter. This occurs typically at temperatures that are above. 45 to 50 degrees, so it is 
it's, when it's cooler, you don't get as much surface loss as, as, as warm weather. Um, but what you want to happen is you want to stay in this ammonium or nitrate form because that's what your crops can take up. But you do have ammonium going to nitrate. That's nitrification. Again, this happens when temperatures are warmer in the soil. There's uh, soil microorganisms that, that control that, and they're pretty much everywhere. And nitrate's very mobile. Nitrate can be lost through leaching downward with water that's percolating through the soil, or it can be lost as N2 gas or, or N2O or anything through denitrification. Denitrification occurs in wet soils that, that don't have oxygen in them. Okay, so we've got wet soil over the winter uh, or a low spot in the field and you see that yellow corn. It's probably yellow because you've got some denitrification and you've lost your nitrogen off as a gas from that nitrate form. So what we really like to see is that ammonium because it'll kind of stay in the soil but the plants can also utilize it. And that either the ammonium or the nitrate is what a plant can take up. Um, so that's basically your nitrogen cycle. Um, and we want to try and manage it to maximize that ammonium or that nitrate that's in the right zone, in, in the root zone for the plants to take it up. Uh, we want to minimize ammonia gas loss and denitrification gas loss and nitrate leaching, which this is the one that some of the environmental folks get concerned about is that nitrate leaching into in the groundwater where that can occur. And in Kentucky, we see a lot of a lot of this denitrification, especially on some of the fragile pan soils. So we're going to talk about how to manage the poultry litter so that you're actually managing this nitrogen cycle. Um, talking about soil nitrogen, a question came up so I threw this slide in a couple seconds before we started about soil testing with poultry litter. And this is something that I don't see very frequently a lot of places and mainly it's because of the labor of collecting that soil sample. But we uh, back east and in the northeast do a lot of uh, uh, soil nitrate tests. It's commonly referred to as the PSNT. And you guys run that out of Princeton, right? So what the PSNT is, 12 inch soil sample. So you put your poultry litter out, you're gonna go and uh, side dress the balance of your nitrogen, what you think you need. And it's a sample that um, guarantees you don't under apply nitrogen. So it doesn't prevent you from over applying nitrogen but it prevents you from running short. That's the way the test was designed back in the 80s. Um, and so what they do is, you take a 12 inch soil sample, where that corn's about 12 inches tall, right before you side dress your corn, and uh, send it off to the lab. Um, and that's the big point. That, that's the, the, the limiting factor why people don't do it, is because of the timing. You've gotta go out there in that standing crop when it's like 12 inches tall, you have a short amount of time to get across all your ground and side dress, uh, but it does provide an index. And generally what we say is there's a critical soil test point of 25 parts per million, okay? And uh, this is the data that was used to calibrate the test uh, for the whole uh, northeast where the test was developed. And what they did was they said, okay, let me look at relative yield. Let me look at a plot that has no nitrogen applied versus a plot that does have nitrogen applied. What percent of max yield can I get? Am I getting 90% of what I got with nitrogen? Or am I getting 80% of what I got with nitrogen? And they said, well, let's set 93% of the with nitrogen plot as the, as the what, what I'm shooting for. And this helps you make a decision whether to side dress or not. And then you've got to use your own knowledge to decide the rate. But they did this on a bunch of manure plots. And they figured out that at 25 parts per million, above that, there was very little chance of getting response to side dress nitrogen. So that's how they determined this test. And then below that, there was a very good chance. But we see there's a lot of noise in there. And there's some that are below 25 that you would fertilize and, and you wouldn't get your money back from that fertilizer. And then there's a handful above that 25 that uh, we said didn't need fertilized but might, but, but might have had some response. But what they find is, is that you've only got about a 7% chance of under fertilizing using the test like this. It does help you dial it in. It's not perfect, but it's just another tool in the toolbox. You know, if the weather's been a little wonky, you're not sure how much nitrogen you got out from your poultry litter, you can go in there, get some of these 12 inch soil samples, send them off to Edwin, he'll run them in the lab. And uh, if it comes back, you know, somewhere in that zero to 25 range, then you need to have a conversation about how much side rest do you actually need. But it's, it's a really good test. It's just a matter of getting out and getting the soil samples that really causes us not to do it so much. Has anyone ever done this, a PSNT, to determine side dress? I don't see it used very commonly out here yet, but you know, with the Chesapeake Bay and all, it's something that pretty much everyone back east on the Delmarva 
that she's a poultry litter is doing when they're doing this task. And, and there's, there's at home quick check things that you can do, you know, yourself, and they're, they're pretty good as well. How long is the turnaround on getting results back? Pretty quick. It's, uh, it's, it's an electro, so if you get it, if you drop it off, if you get it to carry, what, two days in the mail, or she'll drop it off, probably get the numbers back to you in two days. So drive it down, grind it, and then run it. It just depends on the thing, how busy you want to visit that time. There's also what's called the nitro check. Across the board, everything about home soil sampling, I tell you, doesn't work, except for the nitro check, yes. I don't know what it costs, but I know it's cheap enough that there's quite a few folks that have them, and it allows you to do the test yourself at home. I would say, you know how much they run the nitro check, the quick check, it's all of them. I think they're probably like a thousand bucks or something, but it actually is as good as a lab number, and, and you can do it yourself if you want to, but at a 48 hour turnaround time, I don't know if it's worth buying the quick check, I don't know. Um, the, so the other thing that always comes up when I talk about soil testing for PSNT in season is plant tissue, because that seems to be much more popular. And so Evan was with me a few weeks ago uh, at the soil test meeting uh, in Richmond at the Southern State's headquarters. Uh, we, we get together with all the commercial and university labs and have a meeting for two days and talk about what's going on in soil testing, and I gave a talk on the PSNT. And I kind of wagged my finger at the, at the soil testing labs, both university and commercial alike, because tissue testing is a profit maker for, for a soil testing lab. They make money off of that. But the, the fact of the matter is that tissue testing early in the season, when you're side dressing, does not provide you information on how much nitrogen you need. And the reason is the plant is growing so fast right there when you're getting ready to side dress that the nitrogen concentration is changing hourly. So you take that test in the morning, the plant, I mean, you can almost hear corn growing that time of year, right? And so you're growing that plant, and so the concentrations vary in that plant up and down. And so I told the soil test, I said, you know, you guys are out there pushing this tissue test at that, on that small plant, that B4 plant, but this is actually the calibration data. So this is what a good calibration looks like, a good response. Up here, I don't need nitrogen, down here I do, right? This is the tissue test from that same series of studies of whole plant, core plant, total nitrogen versus relative yield. There's no relationship between nitrogen need and a whole plant or a leaf sample at that small 12 inch plant. There's just not a relationship. So that early tissue test isn't going to help you that much. Later in the season we can talk about that more, but early it, that tissue sample is just, just doesn't have enough relationship for me to reliably make a recommendation on it. So, poultry spreader calibration. Uh, really, this is probably one of the most important things because it doesn't matter if you test it, your poultry litter, or not, or your soil, if you don't know what your spreader's putting down, what's the point of doing all this other analysis? And this is the one that we tend to kind of be like, well, I know what my spreader's doing, I did it a few years ago, or what have you, and uh, a lot of times those, those things change, the, the spreaders change, and there's a couple different ways to do it. It's, it's probably worth your time if you're playing um, if you're kind of right on that edge where you're trying to be very profitable, which I think we all are with current, the economist is here, so I'm not gonna talk about money too much, because I'll, I'll be made to look a fool, but, uh, you know, we're playing on that edge, so we wanna get the most out of this manure right now. If we got most of it, we wanna get the most out of it. We wanna make sure we don't have to buy more fertilizer than we need in the current, current market. So I really recommend spreader calibration, uh, there's, is that you up there, Edwin? Calibrating a spreader, the old tarp method. So you run across that tarp, you know what the surface area of it is, weigh what you get, and you, and you get tons per acre. This is what we typically do, and it's probably worth a little bit of extra time if you're really playing on the edge. In other words, if you're trying to be on the razor's edge of getting the exact right amount out there and knowing what you're doing, set out <coughs> dish pans like that every 10 feet, weigh the individual pans, it tells you what the distribution is. Not just how many tons per acre, but what centers should you be running on. Should you be running on 30 foot centers, 60 foot centers? You can figure out how to get a nice uniform application so that you don't get weighted corn by doing it this way because you can get a good idea of how, it's, how that spread pattern is working out for you. And so here's a picture of us calibrating uh, a, a farm over there on the, on the eastern shore uh, of Maryland where I worked previously. You just kind of set all your pans out there and run two or three passes on whatever centers and see how uniform you're, you're getting it and then also your tonnage. If you need help calibrating, I'm going to help you. 
Um, so determining the right rate and timing, uh, I think you got to have a plan even if it's not a good one. It's hard to plan some things because you don't know what the weather's going to be and what's going to happen. But uh, so we talked a little bit about the PSNT and why it works. You know, if you apply all your nitrogen up front, that nitrogen is vulnerable for loss. There's a lot of, as I showed with the nit nitrogen cycle, microbial activity. You don't know how much you have there at the time the corn needs to take it up. You know, so the corn uptake curve looks something like this. You apply it all up front, and you've got all this vulnerable nitrogen out there that can denitrify or leach or volatilize. So what we're shooting for with poultry litter typically is you want to apply at a lower rate um, and then plan on coming in and balancing your nitrogen in season. That's the most efficient way, food feeding that crop. That's the, the highest level of efficiency with nitrogen. And something that we figured out with some of the work that we did is that when you apply lower rates, so let's just say I apply, let's say, eight tons of the acre of a real high rate. The percent of nitrogen that's converted over so the plant can use it is going to be very small. Maybe you're going to get 10, 15% of the nitrogen out of that eight tons that you put down. If I put, let's say I could get all the way down to one ton per acre of poultry that are out there in that field, I would probably get 80 or 90% of the nitrogen out of that poultry layer. Why? I put the organic matter out there, I put the nitrogen out there, so I juice that bug population that's responsible for getting the nitrogen to the plant, and they go going crazy, but now they're hungry. So you got a bunch of hungry bugs out there that are willing to chew on that bone and get more of that harder nitrogen out of that poultry litter versus putting a higher rate down and get a lower conversion rate. So, you know, if you can get it down to two to four tons per acre poultry litter out there, you're going to get more. And I'm talking about spring application. I know most of the poultry litter is going out in the fall or over the winter, but right now I'm talking about spring application. You're going to get a higher percentage of that nitrogen converted over and into that plant. <laughs> If you can push that rate down and plan on coming back with the rest of the nitrogen as side dresses as UAN or over the top as, as urea. So that's that's really the most efficient way to manage that nitrogen and get the right rate out there is to go down to that two to four ton per acre range and then plan on coming in and maybe doing the PSNT right here to see how much you've got and balancing it out with side dress. Plus side dress lets you keep the rate. You can see how the corn crop's going, you can see how the weather's been that year, and by waiting till side dress and holding back, let's say, 100 pounds of nitrogen, you've given yourself some flexibility to kind of address what's happened in the past month. So we've got some recommendations at the University of Kentucky. I, I, since, since I've got tenure, I'll say I don't think they're very good recommendations. I know I'm being recorded. But, um, but the recommendations, nonetheless, is better than flying blind. But what we've got in AGR 146 is, here's your poultry litter, and if you incorporate it within two days, we figure you're getting 60% of the total nitrogen out of that poultry litter. If you incorporate it after seven days, so I apply it and wait seven days to till, I'm only getting 45% of my nitrogen. So what's that difference between 60% and 40%? It's what it's assuming is going off as a gas, as ammonia, into the atmosphere, like we talked about with the, with the nitrogen cycle. So it shows this kind of decrease in available nitrogen the longer you leave it on the surface. And we know that happens. I don't know if it's, if it's quite that drastic, but there is nitrogen loss as a gas when we leave the poultry litter on the surface. Even something simple like running over it with vertical tillage like a turbo till, just something to get it in contact with the soil a little better can kind of increase the amount of nitrogen you retain in your soil. Just getting that litter in contact with the soil a little bit can increase it, you know, but it might only be 10 or 15 extra pounds of nitrogen to the acre by getting that soil contact. But crop prices where they are, that might be worth it. We also account for denitrification and nitrate leaching because up here, okay, two days late incorporation, you get 60% of your nitrogen. Well, what if I apply it in the fall with no cover crop? We're saying that only 15% of the nitrogen in that whole is getting the crop. I actually think that, nit that number might be a little bit high. Might be less than that. Fall application, you can almost write off the nitrogen you're getting out of that poultry layer because you can't guarantee it's going to be there in the spring and the crop needs it. It might be, it might not, but it is really variable. It's really dependent on weather. As wet as this winter's been, fall applied poultry layer, there's probably not much nitrogen left for the crop. Now, this is the part that bothers me. We say that if you have a cover crop out and you fall applied, you get 50% of your nitrogen to your corn crop that following spring. I do not believe that's true, and I will not be betting on that at all. The cover crop is going to take up some of the nitrogen, but if we look at a wheat cover crop, 
Let's say that you're just going to broadcast some wheat out there as a cover crop. Wheat before March is going to take up, what, maybe 10 pounds of nitrogen per acre? And maybe you put 100 pounds of nitrogen out in poultry litter. And so by the time you spray down and kill that wheat crop, maybe if you wait a little bit, if you wait a little bit later to spray that wheat cover crop, maybe you've taken up 20 pounds per acre in that wheat, that would be a lot. That would be a whole lot. That cover crop is not giving you 50% conservation of nitrogen. I wouldn't bet on that cover crop saving you any nitrogen because that cover crop might just be living off the soil nitrogen and not your poultry manure nitrogen. So I really disagree with this 50% number that if you apply in the fall with the cover crop, you can count on having half the nitrogen available. I would not bank on that at all. I would think that you're going to have to supply your whole nitrogen load with fertilizer if you're fall applying poultry litter to some extent. Now, year after year, if you're applying every year or every other year, you're going to have some buildup of organic nitrogen in the soil and have a better supply in your soil that's going to release some. But it's not something you can bank on unless you're routinely doing the PSMT and some things like that to quantify what's out there. And so this is why we're always so adamant. And I know everyone says, you know, it's challenges to apply in the spring. We've got wet soils. There's a time crunch. If you've got wheat, uh, you know, you've got things going on with wheat that you've got to do, and it's problematic. But fall application, economically speaking, is a big loser in my mind. And I'm going to let Jordan get into that a little bit more. And then the other thing that UK recommendations do is address that carryover that I was talking about, that if we applied an annual application over over 10 year period, how much residual N have you built up in that soil? And so those numbers are also in AGR 146. So the last little thing I want to talk about was kind of field management. We talked about rate and where to get that from with AGR 146, but what are some management tools to address some of these trade-offs that we know we have for poultry litter? I talked about tillage. Uh, this was some work that we did uh, in Maryland, uh, but we did chisel disc, uh, vertical tillage with a turbo till, zone till, um, looking at how we could conserve nitrogen and, and, and phosphorus by doing a little bit of tillage. Uh, at one site here, the soil test was uh, 65 uh, parts per million uh, soil test P. So, uh, you know, high enough that we don't expect a phosphorus response, but low enough that it's not an environmental risk per se. So one field, we did four replications of the tillage treat, or three replications of four tillage treatments. Same manure rate across the whole field, same soil test across the whole field. And we looked at environmental loss and runoff. And this was a big thing in the Chesapeake Bay, trying to help the guys out and say, hey, look, there are things we can do to conserve, keep the fossils from running off and coming an environmental problem. And this was chisel disc, strip till, turbo till, and no till. And this is phosphorus loss and runoff. As you can see, the more tillage, the more aggressive it was, the less runoff phosphorus. But if you notice that field, See how flat it is? Erosion wasn't my issue. Now, if I'm on a field where I've got erosion, this isn't going to be true because I'm going to lose a lot of soil P. But you can make these decisions in a little bit of incorporation. Turbo till or strip till doesn't have as much erosion. It's going to get the nitrogen in the soil, keep the phosphorus from running off. So it gives you a little bit of a management strategy for getting a little more nitrogen and having a little less environmental impact. Um, this is just, again, some of that data. But I, I always caution folks because what happened was we did some of this research, and, and as is typical kind of the Chesapeake Bay region, we did this research, all the politicians are looking for any little straw they can grab a hold of to try and decrease, you know, runoff and say they're helping the Chesapeake Bay. And so then they made it mandatory that you couldn't have no-till in the north, right? Now, I know everyone in Kentucky thinks you invented no-till in Kentucky, but in Maryland they think they invented no-till. And in Ohio they think they invented no-till, and in Virginia they think they invented no-till. <laughs> But I'm not sure who invented no-till, but we got a lot of it back home. And so, but now if you're applying poultry litter, you got to have tillage of some sort because they saw this data. But what I tried to tell them was, if you look, it was those first two rainfall events that made a difference. After that application in June, we had a couple rainfall events here with some high losses. The rest of the season, all the tillages were the same. And that only happened in that one year. In other years where we had 40 or 50 days after application before it rained, it didn't make a difference what tillage was out there. So these BMPs, while they work, it's a roll of the dice depending on the weather, how well they work. In this year, they work great. But in a year where the weather's a little different, maybe no till was just as good as, as a little bit of tillage. So Is there a cover crop in that or not? Yeah, well, so this study here, we did not have a cover crop, so we didn't want to. 
mixed, mixed metaphors, but we've done some other work with cover crops. And you're basically looking at the same thing, and if you can do a little bit of tillage, you're going to get it in contact with the soil and have less phosphorus run off. Uh, but the cover crop's definitely going to make this even a, a little bit better treatment because you're going to have that residue out there kind of protecting things. But what we did was we applied the poultry layer till it the same day for this study. So talk about cover crops and, and poultry litter and some stuff like that. Um, we've done, this is kind of the future. Uh, this is things that, that are coming down the pike that we're working on here, and hopefully we'll get something that, that farmers can use so that you can get the best of those worlds. So these fellows down here in Arkansas developed this thing. That's basically a white no-till planter. There's augers in the bed of that thing. It's a poultry litter injector, so you can plant your poultry litter. Now, you can obviously see that you've got basically one opener per auger. So you got an auger feeding each, each opener and delivering that poultry litter subsurface. And then it closes it back up. You don't have any runoff phosphorus. So it's, it's the same as not applying poultry litter as far as runoff and environmental impacts concerned. You have 100% conservation of your nitrogen, so you're getting it all into your plant. So it's a pretty good deal, but the thing is, it's not very practical because you got to have an auger for everything, so you can only be so wide. This one's a uh, nine foot wide. It's just an experimental unit. There's some other engineering challenges, but we're working on this. But you know, one of the things is, there's there's what it looks like going through the ground. Uh, there's the bed with the augers. Some poultry, those are poultry litter pellets which go through a great regular poultry litter. We've had some challenges that I think we've addressed. We're working on a model now that instead of using augers, you use air, an air seeder, just like a planter. Have a big old fan on it. And uh, did you see what we had out there, Princeton? Got a big old fan just like you would have on a planter and actually blowing poultry manure. Our hope is we can make a fold out boom to get a wider spread pattern to make it a little more practical in production. Um, and you can actually blow that poultry manure with a big fan. It's a heck of a fan. Um, and what did we see? We saw that we had much more nitrogen available to the crop. So this is broadcast versus subsurface. Uh, we got about 40 more bushels to the acre because we're four tons per acre of poultry litter. So that's the extra nitrogen we got from injecting it versus broadcast. This is what it looks like in a cover crop. That's a wheat cover crop. We injected poultry litter in it, went in and planted corn. So you can see you can run through just about any kind of residue. Uh, so I, I'm real hopeful for it, but we still have some engineering issues that we're working through to get it get it to work right. This is some more data that we've done for a couple years under irrigation where we put 90 pounds of pre-plant nitrogen down um, from either injected poultry litter, surface applied poultry litter, or surface applied UAN. And then we come in at V6, six leaf stage, and we side dress either 0, 45, 90, or 135 pounds an acre of nitrogen, trying to get that response curve. And uh, this is just how we figure out plant available in, where we say we're going to take half of the organic in and all of the ammonium in. And so our poultry litter was uh, about 2% plant available in. So we were applying about two and a quarter tons per acre. That's the other neat thing with the injector. You can dial it down to a quarter of a ton per acre. Or you can dial it up to six tons per acre. And it is perfectly uniform because of the way it's delivering it through those injectors. So that's a real big advantage is getting that uniform application. And so what did we see? This shocked us because we thought we could go up with a high enough nitrogen rate. And so we're getting up there around 250, 255 bushels to the acre of corn. And we thought, well, if you just keep adding more nitrogen, eventually the, the yield lines will come together. So right here is fertilizer and surface applied poultry litter on this line, right over top of each other. And this is the injected poultry litter. All the way across the nitrogen curve, it, it yielded higher. So what was that? We injected that manure, put it in contact with the soil, and got more complete mineralization of the nitrogen, and we didn't have any of that volatilization loss. So throughout that growing season up to side rest, for that first 45 days, we never ran really short of nitrogen because we had put that poultry litter in the soil. The surface life, uh, applied poultry litter, even at two and a quarter tons per acre, it was on the surface, it wasn't there where it needed to be, and so we must have set the yield ceiling just a little bit lower by surface applying our fertilizer versus injecting that poultry litter. We also added nitropyrene, which if any of you ever use it, uh, and hydrous ammonia, it's NSERV, which has been around since the 60s, uh, but they have now branded it under instinct that you can use it with surface applications and with UAN. It's a liquid, it's not volatile like NSERV was, like a gas. So we treat the poultry litter as we're applying it with the instinct, the uh, uh, nitropyrene, and we saw tremendous results what that instinct does is it keeps ammonium as ammonium, so it doesn't go to nitrate. So think back to what we were talking about the nitrogen cycle. You want to keep it as ammonium. That instinct does that, 
You can't do that with a broadcast application, but with the injector, you can actually treat the litter as you're injecting it and keep your ammonium nitrogen as ammonium in the soil. So I think this has a lot of potential for poultry litter. It's just an engineering challenge at this point to make it practical for production ag. Uh, we got it. If we could get the same yield with 84 pounds less nitrogen by injecting it, or we could get 16 bushels more uh, by putting it on at the same nitrogen rate. So depending on how you looked at it, it was pretty successful. And then real quick, uh, before I break the screen, uh, field storage of poultry litter. So you're going to find a common theme today between Edward, myself, and Jordan that we think uh, fall application of poultry litter is a bad deal. And I always get the question, well, what do I do with the poultry litter? I can only get it in the fall. Well, my recommendation would be to stockpile in the field, not like this. Um, this was a, a, a fight we really had in the Chesapeake to convince the EPA that a properly piled poultry, uh, piled poultry litter is better for the environment than fall application. No question about it. Unfortunately, the EPA uh, was using a little bit of bad data. Um, the state of Maryland went to court with them and were able to get some pushback on a few things. But stockpiling poultry litter over the winter, you don't lose enough nutrients to worry about. You're losing far more. You're probably losing 80% of your nitrogen when you apply it, spread it in the fall. Stockpiling it, a 100 ton pile of poultry litter is going to lose about 10 pounds of nitrogen. And that's just to the soil from soil and poultry litter contact. And why is that? Um, placing it high and dry is the first thing you need to do. And then you need to push it up into a conical shape. And you, I've seen, I saw some nice poultry litter piles driving in here. I'll give you that. Okay, there's some nice looking. A lot of times you see people come in with that dump truck and dump, dump, dump little piles. Spreading it out like that, that's no good. Your litter quality degrades. It's hard to apply because it gets soaky, soppy, wet, and puddle build up in it and you lose a ton of nitrogen. You want to take that motor and you want to push it up into a pot. You got to push it up so that the footprint is as small as possible. You want as much manure in the biggest pile possible because everything that's on the interior of that pile stays good, stays high quality. If it gets spread out into a bunch of little piles, it's a lower quality product. Uh, you want to keep the area around the pile as clean as possible for what it's worth. I know how hard that is. Um, crust formation protects the litter. Uh, very little nitrogen and phosphorus are lost when you do this. The only thing that you see with that is wherever that footprint of the pile is, obviously crops don't grow behind it typically because of salt accumulation. But you know you can do some deep tillage there where the pile was and mix those salts in and balloon them out in the soil and uh, it, it kind of remediates a little bit. If you've got a pad to put it on, so much the better. Uh, this was some work a colleague of mine did in Delaware and basically the point was this was a in the first year the blue line, second year the red line, they were doing 100 ton piles and what they figured out was that pretty early on you lost all the nitrogen that you were going to lose. This is pounds of nitrogen per 100 tons and so in this study he lost between 12 and 15 pounds of nitrogen total and that was leaving that pile. Well, I'm showing 150 days of data here. He kept those piles out there for an entire year, 365 days. So in the first two to three weeks, you lose all the nitrogen you're going to lose, and then you can just leave a stockpile there for six months, and you're not losing any more. So if you're going to stockpile it for one day, you're losing no more nitrogen if you stockpile it for one year, as long as the pile is made right. So this is what I mean when a pile is made right. You see that nice wet line there, and see how good and dry all that interior is? That's that pile after a year. That litter on the interior of that pile is perfectly fine as long as you can keep it pushed off the stockpile. And that's not covered with plastic or anything else. So uh, stockpile is a really good option so that you can put off application until the spring even if you can only get your litter in the fall. And we'll talk about some of the more concerns uh, with that here in Kentucky. So with that, uh, that's my Twitter if any of you twit. And uh, my email address, I'm going to turn it over to Evan because I've used Time. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Good. Alright, I'll take a few questions since they said I'm good. Any questions about storage, about side dressing? Like the cover crop that you had long ago where you, you incorporated some a surface supply, then you had the cover crop on the other. And you seen uh, what 50? I don't know if it's 50. Was that litter applied after the crop was already sold or was it incorporated with the seed? This, this data here, where we were applying the different tillage treatments, 
Yeah, I think my best slide before that. Oh, you're talking about the University of Kentucky recommendations, these. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know how Kentucky generated that data. So that's the University of Kentucky. You thought 50 was too high. So I think that where they're saying that with a cover crop, you're saving 50% of the nitrogen that you apply to poultry litter. What they're saying is putting the poultry litter out in the fall and then plant cover crop or even, you know, incorporate the litter with the cover crop. It doesn't matter. But fall application litter. And a cover crop, University of Kentucky says you can bank on having 50% of that whole other nitrogen for your following corn crop in the spring. I totally disagree with that. Wow. I think you're lucky to get 10% of the nitrogen in that fall application because the cover crop does not give up that much nitrogen. They're saying the cover crop saves that nitrogen taking up in the plant tissue and saving it, and when you kill the cover crop, it's available in the spring. There's no way. And even if it does, when you're taking it up in that plant matter, let's say it's a rye or a meat cover crop, that nitrogen is not totally available because you've got a lot of carbon in your cover crop. <coughs> and carbon is going to tie up your nitrogen. So if you get a big rain dry cover crop out there, you're actually probably going to have to add extra nitrogen to overcome the carbon in that rye cover crop. I would never go with that 50% comes from the rye cover crop. When that crop's killed, it doesn't release back into the soil? Not that it will. It'll be, it'll be a slow process, a very slow process. I don't, you have any idea how much that's available for some of you guys, David? I've got my data I can show you. He, he's, gonna, he's got some data on this that he's going to show a little bit more. But I just have real concerns with that 50% number we've got to I don't think we're there. With that cover crop, Sure, sure, but, it, but as far as the percentage of your poultry litter nitrogen available, I'm not arguing cover crops are great. You should definitely, if you're going to fall out, you should actually have a cover crop out there because it's going to do something for you. It's going to protect the soil. That's the biggest thing the cover crop does is protect soil, in my mind. Well, that's what I was wondering. If they were saying there's, there's different things besides the soil and the plant, they could say some of the light. No, I mean, so what they're generally saying is that they think the cover crop's going to really release the nitrogen to the bottom of the corn crop, and that's the part that I disagree with. But I think you're right, protection of the soil is a big value in the cover crop, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, ultimately, poultry litter is a tremendous nutrient source. We see over and over again that we get yield advantage with poultry litter that we can't explain. But if you want to dial in, I mean, back when I was young, I still feel young, but I'm not as young as I was a few years ago. Uh, you know, you apply a lot of poultry litter, nitrogen is cheap, so you could come in with that insurance application. With the price of fertilizer where it is relative to the price of grain, it doesn't make much sense to have those insurance applications out there now. And it makes a lot of sense to use poultry litter as a fertilizer source rather than just a soil. Now, I remember when I was young, you put poultry litter out and then you just fertilize them and didn't have any poultry litter out there. Those days are long gone. If not for the economic reasons, then for you don't want to end up like my friend and family in Maryland and Delaware with the EPA for you to have your um, and, and that's what that leads to. So, you know, poultry litter has tremendous advantage as far as crop production and managed correctly and tremendous nitrogen source, but the first part of that is putting it down as close to uptake as possible, which means a spring application. So, I'll go off the soda box and let Edwin take over, but I'll be here. I'll be in the area all day. And so, I'm going to start out with the fun stuff just to get it out of the way. But the reason I think, one of the big reasons we have Josh here is because of the all the politicians he got to talk to instead of the farmers. I mean, I've heard him say that several times. I want to work with you guys, not, not the people in D.C. So we want to try to stay out of that situation. Jordan and Josh and I were having a conference call a couple of weeks ago about this meeting. Well, he's covering this, I'm covering that, he's covering economics. I said, you know, very seldom did the agronomic, economic, and environmental uh, aspects all come into play at the same time. I mean, you do it for the right reason, and all these things kind of hit. It's a perfect storm. So if you think about it, if our soil test P values are over 60 pounds per acre, we say you don't expect 
profits bonds. If soil test K is over 300, we don't expect a yield response. Well, if you're not expecting a yield response and you're applying the nutrient, that gets into the economics. And then when you start getting up there soil test P values of 3, 400, now you're getting into the environmental. And, you know, you guys have enough to deal with without someone telling you how to farm. So we're telling you what we think would help. But the other thing is, think about your neighbors. You know, there's, I've talked here several times, I use the term the food police. There's not someone running around saying, I want to find you because. If someone shows up at your doorstep, there's one of two things that's happened. You've either made one of your neighbors mad by something, or they have a bad smell that they're tired of smelling. Then they pick up the phone and they call Frankfurt or someone else, and then Frankfurt sends someone out there to visit you. Or you can have your water sampled by some of these groups, and they see a big spike in, in nutrients, and then that might send them out there. But more or less, uh, it is complaint driven. So work with your neighbors, be considerate of them, and that will keep you out of a whole lot of trouble. I said out of sight, does that equal out of mind? Maybe a lot of times it does, just don't put it in their face. You know, get it off the road a little bit so they don't have to see it. I mean, this is just things that you would, you know, common sense for, for the most part. Uh, watch when or where applied. Um, getting back to the water, if you know we're going to get a four inch rain in the next two days, hold off a little bit if you can, especially if you have some slope or you're getting it next to the waterway. If you're three miles from a waterway on a flat field, it's not too big of a deal. But what if your field sits like this and you're right into a creek that feeds into a river? That's, that's when they're going to, you know, spike. Um, now I have how close to the house or waterway, and that answer really comes back to it depends. Greg probably can answer this better than me, but as far as I know, the only, the only law with teeth that will really get you is the um, division of air. Does it smell? I, I was working with uh, someone in Hancock County, and they got crossways with a neighbor. They called the food police. They showed up, and they said, if you don't do something about this, I'm going to find you $25,000 a day until you take care of it. And I mean, part of it was they just got crossways with the neighbor. He said, can you do something about this? Well, none of your business. Get off my farm. Let me do my stuff. Don't want to hear from you again. Well, oh, yeah, I haven't called the police. Well, anyway, so that's Kentucky, KAR, Kentucky Administration Regulations 53 colon 101. That's the one that can get you. It's been on the books since the early 70s. Um, and what they do is kind of funny. <laughs> I don't know if fun is the right word, but um, <laughs> as a scientist, it just blows me away. But they take one part of that air and then mix it with seven parts of filtered air and then put it up to the nose and smell it. If they smell it, then you're in violation. That's going to be a long nose. I can probably smell it better than Carrie. So, I mean, it's so, it's so, uh, whatever, uh, I think I the right word. Subjective. Subjective. Thank you, Josh. You know, so it just depends. You don't want that. Water pollution, I think the underlying rule right there is thou shall not pollute. There's nothing as far as I can tell on the books to give you codified uh, distances for setbacks. What they recommend, and this was something one of our colleagues put out, is an ID 211. This is 35 to 75 feet from a waterway. If you're using best management practices, if you're incorporating, if you're using filter strips, you can go to 35 foot from water. If not, you're looking at 75 foot. But that's not that's not in, in the rule book. Uh, greater distances from house, from houses. I've seen anywhere from a thousand to five five hundred to a thousand. It just depends. Do you have a good relationship with your neighbor? Hey, it's gonna smell for a couple of days or I will to wait till you're done with your family reunion. And I mean, mostly it comes down to just straight common sense. So think about it before you do it, and I'll save you a lot of trouble. I'm done with the class. Uh, any questions on that?
Okay, so this is some stuff, and this is going to get right into Mark's question and Josh's comment. Um, I've been looking at nitrogen availability. I started with wheat and then started working with corn. So have several there at Princeton uh, on wheat and corn where I'm surface supplying, not incorporating, and then on-farm soybean and corn research. Have one block here in McLean, uh, Henderson, uh, Davis, and Hopkins County. Started this in 2012. So the, the one that I just mentioned, it's an integrated approach and uh, it's funded by the Soybean Promotion Board and the Corn Formation Council. They've been good to us, keeping us going. I hope we get some more funding. I'd like to follow this work on out. But what I was looking at was evaluating the nitrogen equivalencies, fertilizer equivalencies in, in wheat and corn, uh, or in corn and soybean. And then, so, well, not necessarily soybean, but looking at soybean response to nitrogen or some component of the poultry litter other than nitrogen. Um, another thing, and I don't know, I'll ask you this question, how worried are you, are you guys about bringing Palmer pigweed in and poultry litter? I know Mark and I talked about this. I know several people are worried about it. These rice holes that are being used for bedding material, where they're coming from? Arkansas. Arkansas has palm pigweed. So that's something that we we're looking at. Um, doing that in the field and the greenhouse. And then build up the phosphorus compared to commercial fertilizer. Are we building up faster with poultry litter than we are commercial fertilizer? Or does it matter? And then another set of studies, organic amendments. When I say organic, I don't mean not using herbicides, I mean a natural source of nitrogen, like manure. And just looking at differences in nitrogen fertilizer equivalencies. And in that study, I was looking at poultry litter, and then biosolids, people food, and uh, some composting materials. So the small plot results, I'm a little bit closer here because I think I'm going to need it. Uh, we were working on a fragile pan soil, not, the, not a whole Whole, whole lot of wheat. There's still some wheat growing on these fragile soils, but um, this is Ainsville silt loam started back in the fall of 2011, and we applied those three materials based on 100% availability. Um, we don't know. We didn't know, or I didn't know. I didn't believe those numbers either when I first started this, just based on some of the people who have done the work prior to me, and. Uh, so we assumed all the nitrogens available. And then we came back and set up a response curve to see how much of that actually is available based on yield. So for wheat, I put down 100, 150, or 200 pounds of total nitrogen. Well, for corn, we went from 100 to 300. Corn requires more nitrogen than wheat. And then I had four rates of inorganic nitrogen plus a zero control. So for wheat, I went by 30 pounds, zero to 120, and for corn, I went up to 200 pounds, just to develop that response curve. And with Carrie's Monster TV screen, I don't know, can y'all see this line here? So this is my fertilizer nitrogen. That's my surface applied urea. You got a nice curve there. And then here's my different nitrogen sources. This is the rate here, this is the yield here. So we can see with 120 pounds of nitrogen, I got about 70 bushels a week. Not too bad, not, nothing to write home about, but it's a real nice curve. So what we did, there's a formula here that fitted this black line. That black line is a predicted um, response based on this. It's just trying to smooth out those curves. Another way to look at it is here's my yield from the biosolid. I can follow it all the way over to here and then go down. So this one right here, that's my poultry litter. There's 200 pounds of poultry or nitrogen in the poultry litter, and it's down here to uh, about the same yield that I would have with 10 pounds of nitrogen. So this is the exact same data. I just put it in tabular form. So here's my nitrogen rates, 150, 200 pounds of total nitrogen. Here's my yields from the poultry litter, 30, 32, 34. If 
you look at my urea, my fertilizer that I put down, zero and 30. I went from 22 to about 45 bushels of wheat. 22 to 45. Well, with 100 pounds, I'm at 30. So this yield was equivalent to the same yield that I would get with 9.2 pounds of nitrogen up here. So that's about 9%. Of the 100 pounds of total nitrogen I put into that wheat in the fall, I got nine pounds back. Um, put more nitrogen down, got less yield, but because I had more nitrogen, my fertilizer equivalency was lower. Same thing for this 200 pounds. I went up from 30 to 34 pounds of nitrogen, or 34, 30 to 34 bushels of wheat, but that was the same as 15 pounds. You divide that by two, 7.5% available nitrogen. Wheat, that was managed wheat. That's probably going to be a little bit better than something you spread as a cover crop. Um, that was the wheat planted in 2011. Then here's some of that weird data that you don't really have a good explanation for. The, the yields were higher. I maxed out at about 110 bushels uh, that following year. My highest one right here that was the poultry litter it was pretty good. It was about 60% of the nitrogen that I put down in poultry litter that went back into the yield. And same thing, here's my table. So that 100 pounds, 67%. And then 15 and then 25 at the different rates. One thing here that Jack Josh touched on it and talked about it, but I don't think put them both together at the same time, just because it's warm enough for the nitrogen to mineralize and be available for the plant to take it up, doesn't mean that plant is going to be able to take it up. What does wheat do in the winter? It goes dormant. So you might have a few warm days where you can actually mineralize that nitrogen and it's available for plant uptake, but the plant just doesn't need it or is not awake to take it up. So then it goes through those loss mechanisms. So, I thought I had another slide in here. When I worked it all out, I have another year's data that I didn't show. It was a little bit lower than that. I averaged over these high ones and the low ones. It was about 15 to 18% available nitrogen at all that wheat. So that's, that was before Josh ever came here. I, I was really questioning that 50%. Did the same type of practice for corn. It's warmer. When the corn's growing, this is spring applied nitrogen or poultry litter. So it's mineralizing, the plant's small, it's not taking up a lot up front, but as it starts growing, it's becoming available for the plant to take up and it should have a higher utilization. Excuse me. So I just threw these two together. This is 2013, this is 2014. 2013, 35%, 34, 34. That's the amount of nitrogen equivalent to the fertilizer uh, right here. And then in 2014, I had 58, 53, 40. That works out to about 42%. That's surface applied in no-till. I think, um, you know, that's a lot better than uh, 10 or 15% applied in the fall. This was on farm. This was part of that integrated approach that I was talking about. Had six different end rates here, including the zero. And this yellow one that's highlighted here, I have poultry litter plus ammonia nitrate. These are big plots. This is a 60 foot plot by, the shortest one was 200 foot long, the, large, the longest one was 400 foot long. So we're taking up a fair amount of ground. Didn't feel comfortable Okay, here we're going to put this down. Uh, let's see if you can handle a 60% yield loss so I can do research. Didn't want to do that. So we assumed a 50% nitrogen availability. With the rates we were putting down, we were assuming 70 pounds of nitrogen coming from that poultry litter. Somewhere around two to two and a half times the poultry litter were applied. 
And then we made up the difference with ammonium nitrate, and this was all up front. So I was bringing my total nitrogen rate to 200 pounds. Either did that with fertilizer, straight all fertilizer, or poultry litter plus fertilizer. This first one, I didn't have any additional nitrogen. 7%, 0%, 9%, and then we get over here to Hopkins County in 2015, 76%. That was the third year poultry litter been applied to that same spot. And what he likes to do, I talked him out of it the first year, but when we got back into corn, he said, Edwin, I'd, I'd like to run a turbo till or some shallow tillage um, in front of my planter. So we'll go on and do it. He had some ruts in there. So not only did he chase me out of the field, that was incorporated within an hour of me leaving the field, but one thing that happens when you run tillage is you start mineralizing the nitrogen that's in the soil. So you're going to get nitrogen that's just from your soil organic matter. So that's one of the reasons that it's so high, 76%. And then we look at the, the other two, and I can't separate the poultry litter from the, fer the commercial fertilizer because we don't know what contributed what amount. But it, it ranged anywhere from... 34 to got up to 78% of that, all that nitrogen being equivalent to this right here. So that's for small plot studies, and that's the way we as researchers like to work because we can have less variability over a given area. That just makes it easier, so I thought. So now this is uh, those same areas that I was talking about, Hawkinsville, Henderson, McLean, and uh, Davis. My poultry litter plus ammonium nitrate, 200 pounds of total nitrogen, assuming 50% availability, ammonium nitrate only. Yields were essentially the same, 181, 185, 250, 245, 211, 211, uh, 198, 199. Right here in that Hopkins uh, County, actually got a significant yield increase from that poultry litter. It was 189 versus, versus 179. 10 bushels higher where we had poultry litter, where we conserved more. What was 2015? It's a pretty wet year. There was a lot of water that fell. So we probably lost more of that ammonium nitrate nitrogen than we did the poultry litter nitrogen because it's slow release over time, or a big part of it is. So there was a benefit to that. And then one of the questions, Jerry Hayden asked me this last year or something, he said, we use a lot of uh, poultry litter, what does that do to soil test over time? Well, a complete poultry litter is a complete fertilizer, it contains N, P, and K, just like triple 15 or triple 20. So we're adding all that, but plants, especially your grasses, they don't take it up like that. The, the nitrogen is typically removed in the greatest amount, followed by potassium, followed by phosphorus. So you're adding about the same amount of N, P, and K, but you're removing more N and K than you are P, so that P is going to build up over time. So we sampled 2012 before we put any litter down in all four counties and then had poultry litter versus fertilizer um, rates, or not rates, soil test values the following year, or two years following. And I think a lot of this is just the difference in where we sampled, but 60 went to 68, 57. 38, 47, 65. Uh, Henderson, 42 initially, 68, 68. And then Davis, 60, 93, 72. So we're adding more than we're taking out. And just another way, oh, this is for the soil test. K started at somewhere low, low 100s, except for Davis County, it was the 225. They're all, all going up, 174, 155, 130, 144. All these are going up.
And here, here's my yields here. I averaged across the uh, since they were only two or three bushels different, or four or five for the most part. Average across the fertilizer treatments, just to get an idea of removal rates, just to do a calculation. So reported values of nutrient removal per bushel of grain or bushel of soybean. Nitrogen for corn, 0.7. Uh, P2O5, 0.4. K2O, 0.35. This, this happened to be 2014. I had 20, uh, two, five, 211 bushels of uh, corn removed. Soybeans removes three pounds of nitrogen per bushel. A lot of that, it makes its own. It's a uh, not not some of it's coming from the soil, but that's that's uh, pretty high nitrogen. Phosphorus is higher, 0 0.7 versus 0 0.4, and then 1.1 pounds of K2O. So this is what we're removing: 65 bushel beans. That's neither one of those are really shabby. So now here's the amount that I added in my poultry litter in 2013: 140 pounds of P2O5 or phosphorus, 112 pounds uh, in 2014. What's that? 252 pounds of phosphorus was added. What did we remove? 45, 80, 85, 130. We added 250, we removed 130. That's one of those previous soil test values are shooting up. We added uh, potash, 345 pounds, we removed 140. That's why those values are going up. As far as I know, I've never heard of anyone getting in trouble for having too much soil test K. That's not really something that the people look, check the water for. That's soil test phosphorus, so that's, that's the ones that's given Josh's folks in the Delmarva fits. So, what about weeds? We're, we're, we're testing those. We're working in the greenhouse right now. I also was able to, and I didn't realize how hard it was, it's top secret, but I was able to get some feed samples from Purdue and Tyson under the agreement that I would not run it through the lab. They did not want me to know what their nutrient concentration was. I said, that's fine, I don't care what it is. I just want to make sure we're not getting weed seed in on the feed. Through the, the process that is involved, I couldn't imagine it, but hey, let's test all possibilities. Rice holes, the bed material. I was able to get some of that from people that are actually going around bedding houses. And then some fresh, fresh poultry litter samples as well. From the feed, and this is going on right now, if you come to Princeton, I can show you what we've got. But feed, we were not able to find anything. Rice holes, we did find something that really surprised me. It might be rice, it's some sort of grass. I've never seen rice growing, so I don't know, and none of the people that I knew that I worked with, the weed scientists, have it either. And so we've got something about that big that's a grass of sorts. And it's only in the rice holes. No broad leaves, nothing like that, no pigweeds. Uh, nothing, nothing present yet in the, in the uh, new manure samples. Now one thing we do have trouble with, we've learned, is during the summer, when the curtains or the windows open on the greenhouse, we have weed seed blown in. It's kind of giving us fits right now because we don't know how to keep, keep it out other than let's work from about late November to early March and not have problems because we've got, we did have some trays that had thistle in them. Well, guess what? We had a thistle that was hitting right outside the greenhouse, the fans kick on, blow it in. Not only was it on our check or autoclave soil, it was on all these other trays. So there's, there's something that we've got to either try to figure out or go to a different place. What about poultry litter used for soybean production? Um, this is a little bit small. This is that same 051 
100, 150, something like that, or I guess I did 40, 0, 40, 80, 120, 160, 200. So this is my commercial fertilizer. This right here is, this is poultry litter without any additional fertilizer, 70 pounds of additional fertilizer, 140 pounds of additional fertilizer. So without any fertilizer added, we had about a five bushel yield increase. It's like, well, maybe, maybe something's going on here. So that was in Hopkins County, 2014, Davis County, 2014. There was no difference in the yield. Didn't get any bump from poultry litter. But then when we added 70 pounds of nitrogen, we got, oh, that's 12 bushel yield increase. Hey, what's going on here? So looking at the large plot studies in that field, this is a 60 by 400 plot length or long plots that we had the farmer um, harvest, dump into a way wagon. There's six site years of data there. Poultry litters in this column, <laughs> no poultry litters in this column. 67, 64, three bushels. 55. Spring of life. Yeah, everything I've done in corn or soybeans, uh, spring applied. So there's three bushels, three bushels, that's 86 to 83. Three bushels, four bushels, five bushels. Every one of those six years of data showed a three to five bushel increase. And like, hey, I think I might know what it is. I've, I've, got, I've got a thought on this. I was really proud of myself. I figured it out. But, uh, yeah, that's what I thought after I saw the data. <laughs> so, that, that rhizobia is sensitive to free nitrate. If you have enough nitrogen available in the soil, you're not going to get a good inoculation or it's not going to start functioning. Well, so maybe my data, because all my stuff was pre-planned, pre maybe when I put this fertilizer down, we're knocking out the, the infection, so we're not getting it to make its own nitrogen. And then found another paper, it said natural senescence of the nodule start shutting down at about R5. So what happens about R5? That's when you're pumping as much nitrogen to that pod as possible. You're trying to fill out that beam. So we've got uh, a nitrogen making system that's not making nitrogen as much as it's drawing it out. So I thought, oh, okay, there we go. And I was seeing, I was putting about 70 pounds of plant available nitrogen in that poultry litter. So I just assumed, hey, maybe this is slow release nitrogen. It's getting to it late in the season when that nodule stops functioning. Maybe that's where I'm seeing my yield bump from. So what we did, I talked to the soybean board, told them what I wanted to do, and went out and did it. Put down 100 pounds of nitrogen as ammonium nitrate at R1, R3, and R5. And I had three sites. I had a small plot um, there at Princeton that was double crop beans. And then McLean and Davis, they were full season beans. There's my data. <laughs> it's pretty disappointed. Here's McLean, no nitrogen put down, nitrogen, 100 pounds of nitrogen, R1, R3, R5. No nitrogen, 66 bushels, 62, 64, 60. Nothing to it. Okay, let's go to Henderson County. 55 with no nitrogen, 100 pounds at either R1, R3, or R5. It went up five pounds in this treatment, went down a pound, nothing really going on there. Same thing here at, at the station, 47, no nitrogen, 48, 47, 47. So what's going on? There's something that I'm getting a consistent yield bump from soybeans well, I thought it's nitrogen. I'm not giving up. I'm going to give it another shot next year, but I don't think there's anything to that. So if it's not, if it's not nitrogen, what is it? Organic matter, resistance to compaction, well, probably not residual nitrogen for soybeans, improved infiltration. 
uh, plant available water, sulfur, micronutrients. Um, we're getting a little bit of an R and B effect, liming effect from the poultry litter, or is it some other benefit? So we're going to talk about this soil organic matter. A lot of people, this soil health deal, hey, you need to apply cover crops, organic matter, and reduce tillage. All those are good agronomic practices to improve, Im improve or increase soil organic matter. Let's do some math real quick though. So it's not a fast process. If you think about an acre furrow slice of soil, 43,560 feet to six and two thirds inches deep, that's about two million pounds of water, or two million pounds of soil. To increase it by 1%, that's 20,000 pounds. So I, Jordan used a lot of this data that, uh, in his decision tool, but one of the things that we analyze, we don't send the results back out to you, it's something you really don't need, but we can get the number without any trouble, is the amount of carbon per ton of poultry litter. So an average of about 380 samples with 600, 650 pounds of carbon per ton of poultry litter. And there, there's some other math in there that I haven't really, I'm just trying to take it bare bones, take it down. So how much poultry litter do you need to change soil organic matter by 1%? 20,000 pounds per one, for 1% 1 divided by 650 Ooh, excuse me, 650, that's about 31 tons. That's assuming you don't lose any carbon. Well, we know for a fact you're burning off carbon as carbon dioxide. Probably a low number would be assuming that 50% of it goes off into the air, 50% of it goes back into the soil organic matter. So now we're looking at about 62 tons change it by 1%. What's the average rate of poultry litter? Between two to four tons per acre? Something like that. So I used three tons because I figured that was in the ballpark. Making a bunch of assumptions and erring on the side of caution, 20 and a half years to change organic matter by 1% by just adding uh, poultry litter. Poultry litter is good. It's just not that good as far as changing your organic matter. It's just not a fast process. If you can change organic matter doing everything you can, cover crops, reduce tillage or no tillage, adding animal manures, if you can change it 1% in 10 years, you've done pretty good. It's just not a real fast process. So what else do we have in poultry litter that might be giving us a yield bump? I don't think, based on the research I've done, I don't think we have many sulfur deficient crops or soils in Kentucky yet. But if you do, you're getting about 15 pounds per ton of poultry litter. So if you're using poultry litter on a fairly regular basis, you shouldn't have to apply sulfur fertility. You're getting, you're already applying it. About 11 pounds of magnesium. Magnesium, just like sulfur, is needed by the plant. But we already have enough of that in most Kentucky soils. Uh, zinc, that's probably the big one. About seven tenths of a pound of zinc per ton of poultry litter. Zinc is a micronutrient. You don't have to apply a lot to meet that plant de demand. Copper is another essential uh, micronutrient. As far as I know, there's never been a, res a documented response in Kentucky to copper. Even though we need it, there's enough in the soil. So I mean, you're getting these other goodies, but if you don't need it, it's just it's just an added benefit without a positive uh, uh, result, I guess. Here's probably the big one, and Mark brought this out to Jordan last week, and I've I've said this a lot of times in in different talks. You're getting the R and V of about 10 percent for your ton of poultry litter. So R and V of 10% in a ton of poultry litter, that's about like 200 pounds a line. So why am I getting a yield increase in soybeans when I don't think we have sulfur, magnesium, zinc, copper, or a pH issue? I don't know. 
But I mean, there's there's enough consistency there that I think we're getting something. I, I just don't know what it is. So, what do these results mean to me as a researcher? <laughs> I need more information. I need to answer these questions so I can tell you why I think you're getting a benefit from these. Um, nitrogen availability varies. I think. If we tell you you should expect 50% of your nitrogen from an application and you only get 10% back, what are you going to do? Write it off and assume I'm getting zero. Now, if I tell you you're going to get 10% of your nitrogen back and you get 15, you might believe that. I think in the long run, the tighter we can get that, that um, recommendation down, the better our water is going to end up being. We don't, want, we don't want people telling us how to farm. We want to be able to make that decision ourselves, but, you know, they're already there in Delaware and Maryland. We don't want it to be here. Um, I agree 100% with Josh. I don't believe there's 50% unavailability in the uh, nitrogen, and I'm not tenured yet, but, I mean, I feel strong enough to say that. I've said it in many settings. Um, what about incorporation with tillage? Typically, I'm not going to recommend getting out of a no-till system to save a few pounds of nitrogen. If you're already tilling, yeah. Put your poultry litter down, incorporate it, and go on with it and get that benefit. But I'm not going to say, hey, I think you can save $5 worth of nitrogen by incorporating it. You've got other issues to go with it. There's other goodies associated with the poultry litter that I showed you. Um, does it come down to is it still a good deal or not? And before Jordan came along, here was my answer. Put a pencil to it and consider the other benefits. Now Jordan's here and he developed a fancy decision tool to help you do that. So that's, that's really all I have. And I'll answer a few questions. If not, we'll give the other two and a half hours to Jordan to finish up today. Josh has a comment or a question. Oh, I've got a question. Uh, three. Uh, i got one question. Uh, no, that was the answer, three. Oh, three. On your soybeans where you've got a yield response, uh, were those the same fields? I think the soil test came was about 150, 105. Hopkins was the lowest. So is that the same soil good. test case uh, where you saw the soybean response is about the same, same ballpark? Yep. So he answered my question for me, maybe. Uh, response to potassium. I, so rule of thumb, I'd like to see potassium a little bit higher. About 250. Like so Davis it. right here, we're at 295. Davis. Still got a three bushel. That, that could very well be it. It could be some kind of spot ash. Poultry that is a good source of pie because all your sulfur stock is potassium sulfate. Yeah, it's chelated, so it's going to be taken up. Yeah. You have to get in a big environment to discuss that with a colleague, but that might be what it is. What's that? Hopkins County, that's still nothing like over here. No, it's a. Um, is it a Karnak or, mm -hmm. yeah, one of, one of those river bottom soils that carp fertilize for us right over right the year? Yeah. It's pretty tough on there. Yeah. Got any comments, questions? I, I think, so, so when I first came to Kentucky, one of the first things I did was sit down with Edwin and we looked at some of this data. And the first thing that caught my eye is, you know, most of what I say, I'm just making up. I can do my own I don't know. I'm just, I'm guessing. But his data about applying a lower nitrogen rate and all that, it was like, you know. That one, that one side here, but When you look at, at the lower is nitrogen rate, the higher the percentage of that nitrogen you can be used. Now, the higher, the lower the poultry litter rate, yeah. the more the nitrogen is getting out every time the poultry litter. And I, and I think his numbers are dead on that you're probably, if you're, if you're qualifying, you're lucky to get 10 or 20% of the nitrogen out of it. And I, you know, and I agree with what he said about tillage. I wouldn't till just to get 10 pounds of nitrogen. You're already tilling well enough, but um, it's 
switching to spraying, you're looking at, if you're putting down three tons of poultry litter, you're looking at getting an extra 150 pounds of nitrogen to go on the fall of spring. You've already got the cost of application, the cost of litter you're buying for after application. Is it worth switching from an October application to a March application? I want to go back to, no, I, I finished this talk about five minutes before I hit the road this morning. I do. I, I, I'm going back now to this day. I didn't tell you all of this. We put down whatever P and K that we put down in the poultry litter, we put the same amount of P and K down as either that or muray of potash. So we did have the same amount. It might be more available coming from the manure, but the same amount of P and K was, was uh, applied. And we put it down with a drop spreader, any spreader. So I mean, when we got finished, we were within uh, a bag, a 50 pound bag of fertilizer and putting down what we'd meant to over a two and a half acre field. So I don't know, I mean, there's something to it, but that wasn't just a straight phosphorus or potassium response. Even on the beans? Even on the beans. What we did, we put whatever NP and K we put down in the poultry litter, we, we brought the, the total nitrogen up to 200 pounds and we put down the same P and K with that and urine. So there was still something that was in that poultry order that pushed it over the top. <laughs> Happy bugs. So now I guess anyone else have any comments besides Josh? Where you get your money back to it? <laughs> uh, hey, what? That's that's tough. I don't know if I'll be able to get it this year. I was getting it out of Tennessee. And uh, last year I thought I was getting it and y'all might appreciate this. I said, look, I'm I'm, I'm for real I need the I need the ammonium nitrate. Oh, what's ammonium nitrate? I said it's not super kicker, it's not coated gypsum coated urea. No, 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 it's it's ammonium nitrate. And I said so this is the same stuff you built that's so good at making bombs. And they're like, yes, it's the same <laughs> stuff. Well, we show up down there, <laughs> and my, my technician went and picked it up. I said, go get them that urea out of the back. It was 3400. It was sulfur-coated or gypsum-coated urea last year. So I don't know. It's, it's I think, going to be impossible to get now. There's still one more place that I know of in the eastern or south, south central Kentucky, but I don't know if it's worth it. <laughs> Get a dollar or something like that. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to take about a five, ten minute break. Uh, you guys get up, stretch your legs, go eat some more dessert, please, so we can get things switched up and get ready for Jordan. On the road,